Uh, I'm a staunch uh, critic of Meena Thuram Godse Bolto Hai should be banned. I don't think the RSS should have been banned. I don't think that, um, you know, plays and books and movies that went against the secular character should have been banned as previous governments did. Why is it that Mr. Modi can go to the UAE and embrace the Muslim ruler over there, but he can never embrace a Muslim at home? What is the Bhagavad Gita? You know, Arjuna is interrogating from Krishna, why should I fight this war? And uh, so it, interrogation, questioning, uh, uh, challenging authority, this is, this is embedded even in Hindu scripture. Uh, Indian columnist and journalist with various national networks, uh, the BBC, the Times uh, of India, uh, CNN, IBN, author of multiple books and now a politician. Sagrika Ghosh, thank you so much for speaking to Brood. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to start by asking you, in 2012, uh, you had said that being a journalist is more exciting than being in Rajya Sabha or having any Rajya Sabha birth or a government posting. Uh, in 2018, you had tweeted that you would never accept a Rajya Sabha ticket uh, from any political party. And here we are in 2024, where you are uh, a member of parliament from Rajya Sabha. What changed? Right. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary uh, solutions, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I have always been a fiercely independent journalist, a non-aligned journalist. In fact, I had scorn for journalists who, you know, ran after uh, posts and government. And I love journalism, Meher. You know, I just loved it. There was, for me, there's nothing better than taking that notepad, setting off into the field and talking to people, discovering new landscapes, discovering new adventures. I mean, I loved it. I was a field reporter at heart. Uh, I brought my field reporting to uh, editorial writing, but I love the excitement of the field. To me, the biggest um, uh, feature of journalism was questioning power, telling truth to power always being on the opposite side of the establishment. No matter which political party was the establishment, but we were always on the opposite side. You know, we're the gorilla in the room, always asking uncom uncomfortable questions. And I love that. I love doing that because I'm, I'm, I'm challenging by nature and I like to challenge and ask questions. And when I said those, uh, those lines in 2012 and 2018, India was still in a normal space, you know, there was journalism happening, all right, it was challenged, but it was happening. But of late, what has been happening to the media? You know, the media today, I believe, is completely captured, mainstream media is completely captured by the government. And I feel that the time for non-alignment, the independence that I treasured is over because the media is completely muzzled. There's no space for questioning. There's no space for dissenting voices. There's no space for the real stories. What we have is this rah, rah, rah sort of celebration of the regime, uh, the uh, real concerns of people. You know, as we were talking earlier, unemployment, MSMEs, number of deaths during COVID, none of those questions are being asked by the mainstream media. I think what has happened to mainstream media is a catastrophe. It's a calamity. It's a calamity, actually. And I think what is uh, wonderful is spaces like you, the digital world, which are keeping alive spaces that are still free, still independent, still asking questions. But that is becoming less and less. Mainstream media today is completely an outrider and a trumpeter of the government. And I find this nauseating. I find it nauseating, it was suffocating me. For the last three years, I had been distancing myself from the newsroom and I had a cooling off period. And so when this offer came, I thought in any case, my beliefs are such that I firmly oppose religion-based nationalism and religion-based politics. Mm -hmm. That is my, uh, that is my uh, belief, it is my uh, sort of governing ideology. I do not believe in a one-party state. I do not believe that one party can have a monopoly on politics. That one party uses the power of the state to make politics impossible for everybody else. Mm. To, make, to make everything impossible for everybody else. So this touches something very fundamental in me. And I realize that since I'm no longer non-aligned, I'm actually very aligned now. I'm very aligned against this particular politics. I'm very aligned against this, this particular majoritarianism. What we have today is not democracy, it's majoritarianism. 
which I firmly oppose. And I realize that for me, it makes sense to join a political party now in these extraordinary circumstances. Okay. Uh, lots of threads uh, from what you yeah. said. Critics would argue that it is good for the country to have one party in majority mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, be able to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. um, we did have, of course, uh, you know, when you have a coalition in place and mm -hmm. we did have for 10 years mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. 2014, the, both the UPA 1 and the UPA 2. And we did see, uh, as journalists, a lot of issues being stuck, right, in terms of uh, implementing, whether it was... Uh, you know, land reforms, a um, lot of other things in terms of policy. How would you react to that, that to get something done in the country, you must have a party, one party in majority who is able to push this through? So I don't agree with that. Uh, if you look at a report written by the former Reserve Bank Governor Y.V. Reddy, he says that actually the periods of high growth in India are the periods of coalition governments. Uh, if you look at the period from 2000 to 2014, uh, 1991, uh, Narsim Rao did not have a full uh, majority government. Um, in 2004, it was UPA 1, uh, which was a very high performing government. In fact, UPA 1, I would say, uh, you know, there are statistics showing the, how many li were lifted out of poverty, mm -hmm. landmark legislations, the, uh, the Right to Information Act, the Magan Rega, uh, all of which today are proving such, uh, such so beneficial to our polity. Aadhaar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the, um, the digital innovations for which Modi claims credit today were actually done by Manmohan Singh in the UPA, whether it was Aadhaar, whether it was RTI, whether it was digitalization, whether it was Magan Rega, which stood like a sentinel when millions were out of jobs during COVID. Mm -hmm. UPA 1 was a high-performing government. Vajpayee's government before that, mm -hmm. 1999 to 2004, was a very high-performing government, coalition government. Narsim Rao coalition government, Vajpayee coalition government, UPA 1 coalition government, UPA 2 coalition government. UPA 2, towards the later end, became a lot of scams. scams. Right. But let's not forget, we had the Indo-US nuclear deal, uh, Indira Gandhi within... Within three years of her huge majority collapsed into the emergency of 1975, uh, Rajiv Gandhi had a huge majority, 400 plus seats. Uh, where you know, again, after a few years, we had the d decline into the uh, you know into the opening of the the Babri Masjid locks. You had the Shabano case. You had civil wars. You had communal riots. Uh, and, you know, I mean, and Modi's government from 2014 onwards, I mean, if you separate out the hype mm. from all the achievements and all the sort of so-called data that this government is touting, I would say Modi's government is a huge failure on social infrastructure, on human infrastructure, on education, on skill development, and on providing employment for the youth. Uh, yes. Why, why, why do you say that because, on, on these parameters? Because I, I feel that, first of all, on social infrastructure, uh, the harmony between communities is being damaged. Mm -hmm severely damaged. There is civil strife between Hindus and Muslims because of the kind of actions being taken by various Hindu extremist groups. Uh, there is not enough uh, investment in education. You've seen the latest ASER report, which says children in the eighth standard can barely uh, do, do mathematics, mathematics and cannot read basic sentences. We have seen uh, so many evidences of unemployment. Uh, for a few lakh jobs, you'll have millions of people applying. For a few thousand jobs, you'll have lakhs of people applying. There's, there's, a, there's a palpable shortage of good, well-paying jobs. Um, and particularly, I would put Modi's government in the dock because of what he's done to our society. You know, the hatred, the disharmony, the hate between communities, the hate between regions. Uh, you know, this calling of names to the opposition, Khan Market Gang, Latians Gang, Tukre Tukre Gang, um, you know, our urban Naxals. What are these names? Why should people be called these names? Why should journalists be called prostitutes and anti-nationals and uh, names like that? So this constant, this weaponization of his electoral majority to harass and persecute others, to persecute those who he feels do not agree with his policies. This, I feel, is 
destructive, highly destructive of democracy. Uh, it is highly destructive of our social fabric, of our society. You know, what is an electoral majority? When you win an electoral majority, you're supposed to use that major majority. It is a practical instrument to create harmony and reconciliation between different groups. Democracy is a people's rule. It's about talking to each other. It's about deliberation. It's about uh, understanding each other, listening to each other. But when you get that electoral majority and you weaponize it, you know, I'm, I'm the majority and I'm going to, you know, impose my will on you. I'm going to use the power of the state to harass and persecute you. That is destructive of democracy, destructive of society, destructive of, 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 of I would say, even the economy. Freedom is indivisible, right? You can't have economic freedom and then not have social freedom. You can't say the econ in the, on the economy, we're going to have reform, we're going to have you know, changes. But you know, on, so, on social, we will demonize, we will call you names, we will put people in jail who are uh, criticizing us, we will put students in jail, we will demonize farmers' protests. I mean, look at what happened to the farm laws in 2020. Yeah. I mean, you, you brought in these farm laws, which as, a, as an economic liberal, I feel that some of the farm laws do have merit. Right. Absolutely. And I think that uh, that the farming sector is in need of reform. And I think that there is a need to look at ways in which the farming sector is modernized and brought in tune with market demands, etc. I'm in, in agreement with all of that. But what about dialogue? What about building relationships? What about bridge building? One young girl, Disha Ravi, shares a, a climate action uh, document on social media. She's accused of sedition and she's put in jail. Uh, people protesting on CANRC. Now, the right to protest is fundamental. Mm. The right to protest is fundamental in our democracy. It flows from the right to freedom of expression. Uh, people protesting against uh, 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 CANRC, anti-national jail. Mm. People protesting against some capital punishment. You have a right to protest against any form of, uh, uh, any form of uh, 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 legal overreach uh, if you want. That's a right in democracy. Students protesting against capital punishment, Tugre Tugre gang, demonized, in jail. Right. Somebody protesting against NRC, uh, anti-nationals, in jail. Farmers protesting against farm laws, Khalistani, demonized, in jail. Female wrestlers protesting on the street, no action taken against them. The person who do their protest, uh, no action taken on, on their behalf, no action taken against the accused. Mm. Uh, the person who they're protesting the B against, this BJP strongman, Bridge Bhushan Sharan Singh, he's intact. He remains where he is. He's still at large. Their protests are to no effect. In fact, we saw the women wrestlers being dragged away from uh, the site of the protest humiliatingly. Mm. So, you know, while we talk about achievements of a majority government, what achievements? What has happened to our society? What has happened to our interpersonal relations? You know, I grew up not knowing uh, about religious difference. I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I don't identify with religion, but I'm born Hindu. Right. I was, uh, I grew up celebrating Christmas, celebrating Eid. I would go to church. I would go to my friends' houses for Eid. They would come to my house for Durga Puja. My family had a Durga Puja in their house. Uh, my friends would come over. Uh, there was perfect harmony. There are family members of mine who are married to Christians, who are married to Parsis, who are married to Muslims, who are married to Buddhists, who are married to atheists. Right. As, as it is in as many families in, many in families. India. Uh, Suddenly we we're told that somebody is an enemy because of, because of their religion. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, critics argue that at this point in time, it's not like, um, you know, all the policies, the Prime Minister said this, all the policies which have been made on an economic policy level has been made for everybody, irrespective mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. your religion is mm -hmm. uh, in the country. So till the last mile, uh, irrespective of your religion, uh, you know, you will get the benefit of that policy, which probably earlier governments did not do. Uh, how would you argue, uh, you know, uh, this point that before this, what governments had done was more of an appeasement. Let me make a particular policy for a particular section of people and leave some people, others based on religion out of it. 
Mehak, maybe mistakes were made by those who practice secular secular politics in a certain way. For example, as a liberal, I don't think that uh, Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, should have been banned. Uh, I don't think plays like Me Savarkar Boltoe should be banned. Uh, I'm a staunch uh, critic of uh, Me Nathuram Godse Boltoe should be banned. I'm a, I mean, I'm repelled by Nathuram Godse's act, but uh, I do not think that a play that talks about Nathuram Godse should be banned. Uh, I don't think Savarkar's work should be banned. I don't think the RSS should have been banned. I don't think that, um, you know, plays and books and movies that went against the secular character should have been banned as previous governments did. Mm -hmm. But having said that, Mehak, the fact is this so-called appeasement that the BJP keeps talking about, what, what were governments supposed to do? India, in 1947, India had been partitioned. Right. Millions of refugees were on the march. Millions were being slaughtered. Uh, India had to prove against all odds that we were the home of Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jains, all religions. So yes, India did go out of its way to be generous to minorities. India did go out of its way to appear plural, to appear multicultural, to appear as a home for all, not just a home for the Hindus. Mm. And in that sense, uh, yes, uh, there were concessions perhaps given to, I mean, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had once said that Muslims have the first right on India's resources because in, you know, it stemmed from a belief that we need to look after minorities. Mm. We need to look after the, the, those who are, who are vulnerable, who are helpless, all minorities. But, you know, having said that, how can the Hindus say that they, are be, that they have been uh, victimized or have got a raw deal or have, uh, or have uh, you know, not been allowed to flourish? I mean, the, the motto of the Constituent Assembly was Dharmo Rakshati Rakshata. You know, uh, Radha Krishnan was our president and he was a scholar of Hindu philosophy. Um, Rajendra Prasad was our president and he was, you know, steeped in Hindu tradition. So, and, you know, I would say that Mahatma Gandhi was steeped in Hindu tradition. So, right. to say that uh, that Hindus have, you know, got a raw deal from the, Repu from the Republic of India because secular governments have tried to uh, victimize Hindus, I think is complete myth-making. It is falsification. It is part of the propaganda machine that the BJP is engaging in. It is simply not true. Um, the idea that uh, you know that in some way uh, that 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 uh, resources go to to all uh, all all uh, sections and you know it doesn't matter who who is what since resources are flowing. I, yes, I agree with uh, the Prime Minister there. Yes, you know, benefits, the Labharti schemes, all the sort of yojanas and the Pradhan Mantri yojanas and the Ayushman Bharat, all of that, go, it goes to everybody. It goes to all, all sections. But why is it that Mr. Modi can go to the UAE and embrace the Muslim ruler over there, but he can never embrace a Muslim at home? I want to say that, you know, we have seen uh, Mr. Modi hugging the rulers of the Middle Eastern countries and we've seen the warm embrace. I would like to see that warm embrace between between Prime Minister Modi and an Indian Muslim and an Indian Muslim who is ordinary, not just the leader of a community, not just the leader of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a masjid, but you know, the ordinary armed Muslim, if the Prime Minister would embrace him and, and, and show genuine affection, I would love to see that. Okay. What kind of a politician is Sagrika Bosch going to be? Uh, I would like to use the Rajya Sabha birth to not only voice the demands of Bengal because it's a recognition from my home state and I'm coming from Bengal uh, and to, to ask questions on behalf of Bengal. Why, for example, are, uh, is Bengal being deprived of funds? Why, for example, um, uh, state, uh, is the state not getting allocations, the allocations it deserves for, for Megan Rega, for other social welfare schemes? I would also like to be a citizen parliamentarian. You know, I'd like to op use my birth to uh, listen to citizens. People care, would, I would like to listen to people's woes, grievances, and use my platform to uh, be of use, uh, you know, to serve. I, I believe I've been called to serve democracy. I want to serve democracy. I want to serve multi-party democracy. And I want to serve citizens. So I would like to, uh, you know, use, uh, use my political career 
to be a citizen parliamentarian and to be a try and be a model parliamentarian, raise citizens' issues, raise citizens' concerns. I'm there because of the citizen. I consider myself a citizen. Uh, I want to be a politician who's known as citizen first. Okay. Speaking of citizen uh, first, uh, what I wanted to check with you was on, um, you know, Sandesh Khali village. And you have mm -hmm. tweeted about it uh, mm -hmm. very recently as well. Uh, it's at the center of a political storm. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the local TMC leader, Shaja Sheikh, who's mm -hmm. facing allegations of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, the women in the villages have protested. They've carried out the police station. Uh, given these allegations against a TMC leader, how do you plan to address or respond to the concerns of the women citizens in Sandesh Kali? So the Bengal government is responding very strongly. The Bengal government is right there in Sandesh Kali. Camps have been set up. Uh, grievances are being recorded. There's a 10-member police team headed by a woman police officer listening to complaints. Ministers are there recording complaints. 20 people, over 20 people have been arrested. Uh, the key henchmen of Shah Jahan Sheikh have been arrested, they're behind bars. The government is acting, has promised to act, will act. Mamta Banerjee is right there uh, monitoring the situation. All of us are monitoring the situation. And justice is going to be given. It's going to be delivered and it will be seen to be delivered. The Prime Minister uh, has not visited uh, Manipur even once. Mm. Uh, when it came to women protesters, uh, the, 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 the women wrestlers who were protesting, the BJP kept absolutely mum. You, you saw the sight of Minakshi Lekhi literally running from a question on the women's, women's protest. She would not answer a question. So the BJP keeps mum when it wants to. But when it is Bengal, when it is uh, a situation in Bengal, they will rush there, they will interfere, they will try to drum up uh, uh, politicization there and weaken the very government which is delivering law and order. Mm. The incidents have taken place, the government is delivering law and order. This is the time you should strengthen Mamata Banerjee's hand. Mm. Strengthen the government, the government is acting, the government will act. Strengthen the government. Why are you destabilizing the, the, the government which is trying to act against uh, any form of crime against women? We've recently had a Horrifying case in Rajasthan, yes. where a woman uh, was raped and then shot right. and then and then attacked with a blunt object. Now, what about that? I mean, uh, if it's a non-BJP, if it's a BJP rule state, then such rapes and such attacks go unnoticed. Then there is no jungle raj, breakdown of law and order, send in the uh, NCW, send in fact-finding commissions. Those are completely ignored. But when it's a non-BJP state, when it's an opposition rule state, then we have jungle raj. But this so is a TMC leader. It's a sitting TMC it's a leader. It's a sitting TMC leader against whom there was, as I said, there was this court stay, which is why now that that stay has been removed, the state government has gone on record saying we have filed an FIR and he will be arrested within seven days. Arrested within seven days. Um, I want to circle back a little bit on the journalist, journalism bit that you had spoken about. Uh, back in 2012, uh, you had a show that you used to anchor, which was called Question Time with Didi. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you remember that clip uh, where Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee had walked off uh, yes. when a student questioned the conduct of the Trinmool uh, leaders like Madan Mitra uh, and um, uh, Arabul Islam. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, she'd call the student CPM, Mm -hmm. uh, cadders, Maoists uh, and you know that clip was there where you are trying to pacify her and she gets up and walks out of the stage with an mm -hmm. audience which is mm -hmm. sitting. What I want to ask you today is how did your relationship with uh, Mamta Banerjee evolve over the years uh, and tell us a little bit about what happened during that clip and after it. So that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I think that was a case when she had just become chief minister and I think she was surrounded by a lot of hostile forces. Remember, the left had been embedded in Bengal for 34 years. So she was under attack from many quarters and I think she was feeling cornered. And I think in that particular show, there was a feeling that perhaps there was some, there was some conspiracy among the students to uh, target her. Uh, but since then, you know, she never cut off communication with me. She actually, after the show, I went to her office and she answered questions. She gave an interview, which we played subsequently the next day. She never tried to, um, you know, shun me or cut me off or not take my questions. And in fact, we our relationship evolved well over the over the years because we developed a certain trust. Mm. Because I think she realized that I was I was for real. I wasn't setting up any kind of conspiracy, uh, you know, and that that was 
purely a misunderstanding between her and the and the audience uh, she never shunned me she never stopped taking my questions she never stopped coming on the channel she never stopped uh, coming on our shows she never stopped coming to our programs uh, and i thought that was quite uh, quite remarkable that there had been not many politicians would do that you know that they they walk off a show and then continue to have relations with the with the journalists okay how would you respond to critics saying that journalists should not become politicians how do you see this because for a lot of uh, you know you've been trolled as well when you were mm -hmm. a, a journalist on on being partisan or you know uh, questioning one form or the other how do you see something like this uh, play out and i have a sub question to to that as well but i'll i'll let you get on with this one first so you know what what people call partisan i see as normal I see as normal. It's normal to stand up for constitutional India. It's normal to stand up for secular values. It's normal to stand up for multi-faith India. It's normal to say Hindus and Muslims should be brothers. It's normal to say religion doesn't matter. It's normal to say caste doesn't matter. I see this as normal, real, genuine, constitutional India. But in the crazy. Uh, psychotic times in which we live a normal position is seen as partisan and eccentric no you know, maybe, as, as mad maybe but i can I mean, reframe that what i mean but no i i, I agree you don't know i i think you have a point because you know when the center shifts when the center shifts so far to the right then those on the uh, on the on the in the center become like as if they're mad lefties you know but we are not mad lefties we are arguing for constitutional india so anyway i don't consider myself partisan and i've always believed that journalists should not join politics mm. uh, should they, they should the journalists should be uh, independent and they should uh, uphold the values of the press and they should uphold the fourth four estate and uh, they should not be tempted by political power but what's happening to journalism now mehak i mean journalism is finished there's nothing left the the government has has completely finished off media finished off the journalistic space so there's no space anymore for to do journalism so since there's no space anymore to do journalism i feel that to keep alive dissent and to keep alive this questioning spirit to keep alive uh, the ability to challenge the government it's important to join the political opposition remember i've joined the opposition mm. i've not joined the government right I've not joined, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I, I've joined the opposition at a time when the opposition is supposed to have no chance. In 2024, is supposed to be a done deal, and you know the BJP is supposed to be coming back with a huge majority. The opposition has little chance. That it's it's in this time that I've joined the opposition because I feel I feel I firmly am passionately convinced that unless the opposition breathes. democracy can't breathe the media can't breathe civil society can't breathe uh, dissenters will not be able to breathe questioners will not be able to breathe the opposition has to breathe i'm down to my last two questions uh, my second last one is you authored the book why i am a liberal um, a manifesto for indians who believe in individual freedom what does being a liberal in india mean today Being a liberal in India means you are under siege, you are embattled, you are finding that the state, uh, the Indian state, which is a very powerful organization, you know, the state is uh, in India is a colonial state. It has tremendous power. The state has access to legitimate violence. The state controls. Uh, enforcement agencies the state controls punitive agencies the state controls uh, force the, the state is a uh, has a monopoly on violence so now if the violent state is turned against the individual and intrudes into the personal rights of individuals the individual is helpless against the this powerful uh, um, armed might of the state uh, you know gandhi was a liberal through and through in fact gandhi was a libertarian he used to often say that i look on the state with the greatest suspicion he didn't believe in state power he saw state power as inherently violent he saw the imposition of the state's will on the individual as in inherently violent today you see the state intruding into every aspect of our lives what to eat what to wear who to love whether you can have a live in relationship or not if you want to have a live in relationship you have to uh, get permission of the state 
As soon it'll be, you know, uh, 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 certain foods will be banned, certain uh, certain forms of recreation will be banned. Stand-up comics can't uh, uh, can't practice comedy in uh, you know in India in, in India because they may be anti-national. So at every level, individual rights are being squashed out by a violent expansionist state. And so being a liberal, uh, I'm terrified. I'm terrified at what is happening to individual rights and individual freedoms. Look at what happened to this. Uh, there was a uh, there was a professor who who had been uh, invited to India to speak at a conference, and she had she's an OCI. She's a holder of overseas citizen. She's an overseas citizen of India. She was deported by the government because of something. She was. I mean, what's wrong? And what a professor. She's a professor. She, she should have freedom of speech. Yes, she, she had comments on Kashmir. I mean, she she. Uh, this is happening within the confines of a scholarly uh, forum where you know view vad vivad samvad is integral to the Hindu way of life, you know, is integral to argument. Is you, you look at the Upanishads, the questioning of Gargi and Yajnavalkya. I mean, I've studied uh, these religious tracts and they are full of questioning. In India, in Hinduism, the seeker is always questioning. The seeker seeks alone and the seeker questions, constantly interrogates. What is the Bhagavad Gita? You know, Arjuna is interrogating from Krishna, why should I fight this war? And uh, so it, interrogation, questioning, uh, uh, challenging authority, this is, this is embedded even in Hindu scripture. So I think that, uh, that to, uh, to uh, shut this down, to shut down questioning, to shut down uh, freedom of expression, to shut down students, maybe what students are saying are wrong, but they have a freedom to be wrong. You have to be wrong. You, should be al you, can, you are allowed to be wrong because it is only when you're wrong that you can learn. And, and so this, this, this process of, um, of, of laying down, you know, that there is one nationalist line, anything else is anti-national, I believe it spells doom for um, freedom, uh, for liberalism. We are founded as a liberal democracy. Our constitution is one of the most liberal documents in the world. Uh, yes, liberal freedom means it comes with a sense of duty, comes with a sense of responsibility. Yes, we are not here to question the sovereignty and territorial integrity of India. Yes, we are not here to uh, become agents of enemies or anything like that. But the reason why we are questioning is because we are patriots. We want to use our uh, power to question to hold our country to the highest possible standards. Mm. The country must be of the highest possible standards. We are not trying to attack the country or damage the territorial integrity of India. You know, all these words are bandied around. Of course not. My last question to you is, uh, in an interview to the News Laundry in 2012, you had said that politicians and journalists cannot be friends. Uh, considering your significant, of course, years in journalism, uh, your husband Rajdeep Sardisai being, uh, you know, a, a seasoned journalist, how are you going to handle the situation at home? Good question. Uh, so far, Rajdeep and I have been keeping our lives completely separate. I think he does his uh, his uh, work in his part of the house and I do my work in my part of the house. And I think uh, what we have evolved is a certain sort of division of space. Uh, so um, the spatial division is helping us to cope with our different areas of life. But we have, uh, and I th I, we have made a rule that uh, we don't speak about work at home at all. So he doesn't bring his work home. I don't bring my work home. So at the moment, our conversation is restricted to uh, the kids, uh, the dog, <laughs> the garden. The neutral territories. And uh, the neutral territories. But there are certain, um, I mean, our dog has died, but we're planning to get another new dog. So that's what we're talking about a lot these days. And of course, uh, our family. So, But, uh, but work-wise and uh, news-wise or politics-wise, we don't talk about that at all. It's hard. To keep it's hard. It's hard. But you know, uh, but I prefer to keep my counsel. He prefers to keep his counsel. So at the moment, we are only talking about um, how to get a new plant. <laughs> All right, Sabrika Bush. Thank you so much for your time to brood. Thank you so much. It was lovely to be here and lovely to talk to you. <laughs>